if I drag this, you guys over here. Okay, on Zoom, everyone can see you in the room now. Okay, so wave to everybody in the room. Don't yell out, please. <laughs> it's fun. I wish there was a way to show what is being shown, which is being shown. I wish that could happen. But, you know, it's a little, it's like, I did that the last meeting. Do you guys, do you guys remember the last meeting? Right, where, where it was just infinite loops over and over and over again? That was great. I enjoyed that one a lot. Um, I'm feeling, uh, what do we think? Let's get started. Let's get started. We got a lot. We got a lot to go on to. Uh, to <laughs> we got a lot to do tonight. So I'm gonna click the button that starts um, all of the music and the intros and the things. I'm gonna fade out the always Sunday playlist, one of my favorites, and then I'm gonna go over here. I'm gonna talk incessantly while I do this to decrease my nerves. You guys know I get nervous every time I do this. I really, I really do. I really do. But watch this. Here we go, everybody. We're gonna start. I'm gonna click that button right here. Here it comes. All right, now, now if everything works correctly, here I am and here you are. Hi everybody. <laughs> All right, we've, we've made it through the first two minutes without a technical glitch, it's fantastic. Um, I wanna thank you guys all coming out to this evening's installment of Brass Tacks, Nothing But Facts. Uh, some of you may remember, um, well, you know what, let's just real quick, let's just talk about digital translations. Uh, we do have these fancy traditional uh, translation headsets. These are translating into Spanish, so if anyone wants to listen in, uh, it's, it's quite fun. We've got one user in the house today, but that's okay. They're here every week. Uh, you can click the power button. Uh-oh, uh -oh. someone's on, on mute yourself on Zoom. I'm standing in front of the room. I can't go over there to click the buttons. Um, first off, I wanna give a thanks to the Bolinas Community Center. For those of you who don't know, the Bolinas Community Center supports the Bolinas Civic Group by allowing us to host this meeting every month uh, for just the limited cost of what it costs for electricity. And by that, I mean, they, they, they don't even charge me for that. So in respect towards the Bolinas Community Center, I always want to thank them uh, for giving us a chance to uh, show these presentations to do this community event. And uh, there's some QR codes up there to give them money. Um, and, uh, and that will help them out and help us all out because then the lights will stay on and I'll have enough power to make all these computers work. Okay, so we're gonna do it again. We're gonna do Bolinas Civic Group Presents. Uh-oh. There we go. Brass tacks, nothing but facts. And brass tacks, nothing but facts is the theme of this new prezo about this one. Uh, the idea is, is that we focus on facts. Uh, we keep ourselves sticking to the facts and informational stuff. So the way that this works is people come up, they talk, they say things. We want to be respectful in the room. If you're yelling out in the room, nobody can hear you on Zoom. And there's a fair amount of people on Zoom right now that would love to hear what you have to say. But then, of course, it's also interrupting and we want to keep it moving and flowing. So uh, hang out afterwards, talk to the speakers and presenters, and let's get into the agenda. The agenda is, as always, announcements first, then speakers, and then projects. Today, uh, we have, as far as announcements, wait, I did that slide. Okay, one more slide, one more slide. Let's get into announcements. Uh, community announcements are, starting off, where's Eli? Is Eli in the house? Okay, I'm gonna be Eli for a second. Uh, Eli's doing a coloring book for the Bolinas, uh, Bolinas Community Center. Um, I, and so he wanted uh, me to tell people, or he wanted to tell them himself, or whatever, herself, I don't even know. We know that the coloring book is there as a fundraiser. Um, I'll put a link to um, a picture of it on this website afterwards once I get that picture. Um, next up, we have Don Smith. Don Smith is gonna talk a little bit about short-term rentals. Yes, come on up, Don. What? Sorry, am I talking fast? I'm talking too fast. Am I talking too fast? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> not this time, Annie. Don, come on up here and talk about it. You can just tap the button there. OK, so um, this is an update on the short-term rentals project that I've been working with a group of West Marinades for six or eight months with. And um, there's an urgent hearing coming up on that. And we just uncovered this recently. This is the scariest thing I've seen so far. 
This is an online solicitation for an investment club that you can send money to and they guarantee you this huge return. And uh, they are basically buying up residential homes in neighborhoods like, you know, the Bolinas Big Mesa, they will be coming to our neighborhood and, and, and putting them online as completely 100% commercial investments. Nobody who invests in this ever goes to these houses or don't, don't need to, it's a passive investment. That means you don't do anything, you just send money and they give you your returns. Um, this is just wholesale commercialization of our residential neighborhoods. And once a house goes into one of those, it's never coming out. Um, so uh, we have to stop it before it gets out of hand because there are many, many more of these out there and they're proliferating. And we have an investment club from Mill Valley um, called Amalfi West LLC that already is doing a house on Terrace Avenue as an investment. And uh, there may be others, uh, the county's not tracking this is the problem. And so um, here's the situation. Unhosted uh, short-term rentals are whole houses, very different from somebody who's the primary homeowner living there, renting rooms out as a B and B or whatever. That's fine. It's it's people who are buying up houses. They don't live here. Um, now, some of them are second homers who are involved in the community, and that's okay, too, and we need some for visitors. But what we've seen in the last five years, there was this um, doubling of whole house short-term rentals. There was a bonanza during COVID because everybody wanted to come out here and get away from all the people in the city. And so I I've been... Um, urging the county since 2015 with a with a group back then and then more recently with this group uh, we raised the alarm back in 2016 uh, that like we have to do something about this situation the response was to put in the good neighbor policy in 2018 which basically said oh you can do this just be nice about it and and this is what's happened and and in another five years it may double again and, and, and so now we're saying we got to get back to where it was. It's already too high. 16% of our housing stock is way too many short-term rentals, more than we need. They're killing our communities. Stinson uh, uh, can't find volunteer fire department. They're going commercial, fire, uh, you know, a, a paid fire department. It's, it's a loss of community. So, and, and so what's so, next on? Um, what does the draft ordinance that just rolled out two weeks ago do? It increases them beyond current levels. What we need to do is to roll them back. And what you need to do, if you want more information, go to our website, Westmoreland mm -hmm. Residence for Housing. But in any case, write to the Planning Commission, Planning Commission, two Ns, two Ms, two Ss, at marincounty.org and tell them to roll this back to 2018 levels, have the current number of whole house short-term rentals. We have to do this or we're screwed. And then go to the hearing week from Monday and speak up. Thank you. Oh, David? No one can, no one can hear you on the way. Okay, so David's telling me that if you go to that website, Westman Residence for Housing, and click on the link, there'll be a letter ready to go to the Board of Soups and the Planning Commission, or you can write your own if you want to personalize it. Either way, just do it soon and tell all your friends to as well. Thanks, Don. If anyone's wondering why I ever talk so fast is try to make up time in between our speakers because uh, we try to stay to a tight schedule. Thank you, Don, for all of that fantastic information. West Marin Residence for Housing has a lot of good stuff on there and we link to it on the website on Bolina Civic Group if you're looking for more information later. Next up, we have the Mountain Film Festival. Come on up here and give us a little bit about that again. Hey, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the important work you're doing here. 
Um, I just wanted to let you all know, if you haven't heard already, we're bringing Mountain Film on tour for the first time to Point Reyes. It's a phenomenal film festival that's been running for 50 years in Telluride, Colorado. I've selected five phenomenal films um, about adventure. Some of them uh, are really beautiful so social justice pieces, um, uh, tight-knit community of rock climbers in Palestine, feeling the, the weight of the Israeli occupation is a pretty timely piece. It's a festival award winner, among some other really truly phenomenal films. Um, the event starts at 5 p.m. and Kelly McFarling will be playing, and then we'll have the five films starting at 7, and a DJ set following that at 8.30. It is an outside event, so please bring warm clothes, sleeping bags, chairs. Um, we're gonna be under the stars, which is delightful. It's looking like clear clear weather, so we'll be all good in that department. Um, and then this is a fundraiser for my nonprofit where I bring um, women on really incredible healing journeys in nature and also story tell as well. So I hope you can make it. Um, I think all the information should be linked for finding tickets. And um, I hope to see you there. And thank you so much. Anyela, and I live on the Mesa. I'm a local, so Anyela. Yeah, it's nice to, nice to see you all. Thank you. Thanks, Anyela. Uh, I'm excited about, I saw a picture of Anyela's um, stage that's set up out there in the field. It looks like a big stage. It's gonna be really cool. And uh, those bands are great. Next up, you know, a lot of you asked about getting together and talking, and I know that a lot of the times dialogue and conversation can be difficult within these meetings because of all the things that we need to do to support our remote and our local and the, all the stuff. And so exactly the opposite of that, we were offering up Bolina Civic Soup, which I brought up last time, but I'm going to actually bring up details this time. So October 19th. Uh, from 5 to 8 p.m. at the Coast Cafe. We've invited a whole host of presenters and other folks who have been involved in these meetings over the last six to eight months uh, to be there. You all and everyone is invited. Uh, the Coast is offering up a seasonal soup for everyone to enjoy. Uh, There's gonna be about conversations, about meeting the folks that you've been working with, asking questions, uh, engaging in conversation, and having soup and breaking bread and all that good stuff. Um, I said everyone's invited, uh, but if you could RSVP on the website, you, you don't have to, it's no big deal. We're just trying to gauge how much soup we need to make. Uh, we expect we're gonna be making a lot of soup though, uh, but there's a lot of great people from the county, other nonprofits, um, as well as a bunch of the folks who've been presenting over the last six months. So all of you in the room, I assume you're all gonna be there, maybe, maybe, we, we'll see, I'm gonna be there. Um, don't, oh, it's Thursday, it's absolutely free. Free for everybody. Thursday. I should have should I put that on the slide. Thursday the 19th. That's a, is that next week? Oh man, so much is going on. Anyway, uh, that's next week. Uh, there'll be some flyers around town and the papers, etc. Everyone's invited, totally free, uh, and it's going to be really good soup. Oh, vegan, vegan as well, because we want everyone to enjoy the soup. And they tell me that vegan soup is actually good. That was a joke, 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 making jokes. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what slides next. Let's see what's that. Oh, community speakers, we're doing that next. Um, we have a really uh, jam-packed evening this evening of community speaker. Oh, shoot, I totally, you're right, you're right. This is where I was supposed to call for additional. Um, oh, goodness, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm totally going the wrong way. Let's go backwards, 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 backwards. There we go, come on up, <laughs> sorry. See, sometimes people want to give announcements at the last minute, and I'm not, so I'm supposed to say, if this, does anyone else have any announcements, and guess what? Hey, everybody. Thank you, Will, for letting me squeeze in here, and I always love to stand behind a microphone. Um, I am saying, um, I want to announce a KWMR special that I am helping to facilitate called Abortion Stories. It's an opportunity to read your abortion story for a recording that will be aired at a later date. This can be done anonymously or not, and stories can also be read by an actor or a friend. And you can send anonymously to me, uh, PO Box 134, or email me, Molly McGuire at me.com. It's in, all this information's in the hearsay too. With your preference on how on how and what you'd like to do everything will be completely confidential and you can also email me to say i'd like to tell my story but i'm not gonna print it out for anybody else to read and that's great too 
But I recommend writing your story down and keeping it to about two pages double spaced just so that everybody can have time to tell their story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Molly. Um, I like the radio. Uh, you guys do that radio show. I started a radio show too, but I'm not going to promote myself right now because I'm already doing that. Um, that was a joke, maybe not funny. Here we go, community speakers. Uh, da, 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 da. So community speakers are things about the community from local, uh, West Marin and county. Up tonight, this evening, uh, we've got a local uh, presenter doing uh, disability and accessibility in West Marin. Uh, we've got the BCLT presenting on their project. We've got Mar uh, the Marin Health and Human Services, which is going to be talking about their HEAL program. And then we have a presentation from West Marin Community Services, which is pretty good. And then after that, we'll do projects. So. Uh, Jacqueline, you ready? Okay, before I get started about my stuff, I just want to comment on 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 how easy it was to go to uh what was that uh, website again uh West Marin residence uh for housing so uh West Marin Residents for Housing dot org, and you just click on the on on the link, and it takes you to a preformed a preformed email, and you just go down to the bottom where it says name address and email and put all your own stuff in and 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 then hit send it's really uh it's really uh that easy and if you've got your email hooked up through your phone you can even do it uh, while I'm talking. So, <laughs> um, I don't know how many of y'all go to the food bank, th and uh, this absolutely isn't the presentation that I had intended to go, intended to, intended to give tonight, but I figure that with a smaller, a smaller audience, I I may as I may as well uh, keep it uh, real. So I bring up the food bank because for uh, because for uh, because for at least a decade they have uh, blocked. This, uh, this, uh, this, uh, disabled, uh, this disabled, this disabled parking sp spot out here at exactly the time that disabled people need to get down here for food. And for however long, it's, it has really seemed like nobody cared but me until I filed a complaint. <laughs> and then they, and, 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 and then they suddenly cared. So um, I would love to see accessibility without somebody having to, without somebody having to, Got somebody he having to fight for it, or 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 
or get heckled by their friends or get told that if they if they file a complaint they become un 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 enemy even though oftentimes legally that's a that is exactly what happens so uh yeah i don't like using two screens but that's what we're doing right now um ableism as taken from the the urban uh, dictionary is the discrimination or prejudice against people who have who have disabilities ableism can take the form of ideas and assumptions stereotypes attitudes and practices physical barriers in the in the in the in the environment or larger scale oppression okay you guys can uh, you guys can uh, read uh, the rest um so back in may i was here hosting our supervisor uh, dennis uh Rojuni, and and he's a really a really big a really big uh, a really big shaker of hands so when he went so when he offered his right hand for me to shake i did the same and he's met me before he uh he knows uh, he knows that i'm uh he knows that i'm uh he knows that i'm uh disabled but he recoiled and wandered off to and wandered off to shake somebody else's hand and then i sent a letter to his secretary who i have a bit more of a relationship uh, with and explained the situation so he came out one day and apologized to uh to to up uh, to uh, Randy, um, who is the she's the she's the big guy in charge here, and that's a form of uh, and that's a form of ableism called called mm, infinite mm, infantilization, and you see it a lot when disabled people are out in public in like a in like a restaurant and and the wait staffs uh, speaks to the people with the person with a with a disability in instead of to the person who has the disability um so okay you guys saw the uh the food crates all up in all up in the all up in the parking spot which is nothing we haven't seen um 
every Thursday at uh, 10 a.m. for the uh, for 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 the last few years. Um, um, here we have a social worker illegally parked in uh, in 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 the in the disabled spot on uh, the other side so disability dis uh, uh, disability discrimination occurs on every level here in Marin it it occurs when the workers and the library um, couriers uh, park in 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 the in the disabled spot uh, uh, just for a minute and that becomes really problematic because then other people seen see official official vehicles uh, doing it and they think well I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to be here for uh, that long, and uh, and uh, and uh, they did all the time. Uh, so, and then, uh, um, other forms of discrimination uh, um, uh, occur a lot at the civil level at the civil level like for instance i can't get regina's office to get back to me about uh, uh about disability related issues with the marin county with the marin the marin the marin county the marin county um, housing authority who also has a huge uh, background of of uh, of uh, disability of disability dis discrimination. So it occurs again in housing, in the education system, at at the at the at the civil level. And most often, the most effective way to change things is to sue. But when, when, but when you sue, you have to have an attorney who's willing to do it. A lot of disabled people don't have a lot of money. And so the ooh, and so they do not have a lot of spending power, and that makes change, uh, and that makes change uh, really difficult. So a few of the things that you can do are watch the language that you use when speaking to people with uh, with uh, disabilities in addition to uh, what I already uh, what I already put up there does anybody want me to read it no again okay uh, a lot of us really dislike the terms uh, special needs our needs are not special accessibility should be a should be a human uh, right um so yeah <laughs> hey guys is it all good <laughs> okay so don't park in it, don't park in handicapped spaces unless you need them. 
don't park in the in the ramp areas because those are for people who have uh, wheelchairs to load and unload their chairs. What? I, and the hashtag one. A lot of people do not know this, but when if you are if you are if you are on social if you are on social media and you do use hashtags oh yeah that's what yeah that's what i was referring to too no no worries <laughs> just but anyways uh uh my point still stands like if you're on social media using hashtags um capitalize each up word because it makes it easier for screen readers uh, to uh, read to the blind and, 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 and hard of, of hearing folks. If you have any questions or, or um, comments, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, Jacqueline Patterson, and you can always reach me at uh, medicalmaryjane at uh, gmail.com. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Jack. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. I also, as a dyslexic, really appreciate it when people uh, in, in, do the capitalization on the hashtags because I, let me tell you what it's like when the words don't look like words anymore it's really frustrating so thank you for that uh, up next we're going to continue with our community speakers we have annie o'connor who's going to talk yes and i'm not seeing your co-patriot but i'm sure we can get started yeah annie ah do we have her on the text? Yeah, we. Yeah, let's. Uh, we'll come back. Let me see. Uh, who's next? Um, the next is well, we can do the uh, the, the the Zoom for the uh, Marin County Heal. We have Alani. Let's just skip to that. Um, this is the Marin County Heal Collaborative. That's Julia Van Suleen and Alana. Uh, well, well, I'm gonna really gonna re I, uh, <laughs> words and spelling and stuff. Okay, um, real quick, uh, I have Alani here. Alani, can you speak for a second, make sure everybody can hear you? Sure, can you hear me? I, I probably, when we start the presentation, I'll probably turn off my video because the, the computer is kind of funny with the video and everything uh, presentation, but can you guys hear me right now? Sure can. I'm gonna stop sk sharing our screen here. This okay. is where it's technically very complicated. And I'm guaranteed to screw it up, but uh, go ahead and start sharing uh, for us and see if we can get that on there. Okay. If you it says something like the host is disabled screen sharing, I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. Fantastic. One second. And let me just, for those of you in the room while we're waiting, we'll just go to speaker and we'll just bring this over here. Uh, so it says it's, it's uh, Will, it says that the screen sharing is disabled. Uh, <laughs> give me one second, everybody. I apologize. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is really difficult to do all by yourself. <laughs> uh, someone, Gabe, tell me where that is. Um, it should be, it should be like on the lineup on the bottom. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Got it. You think I know this. Uh, advanced sharing, one participant, multiple parents. Advanced sharing, host only, all participants. All right, yeah. nobody else go except for the person who's supposed to be talking right now. Okay, thank you. Can you see the screen? We sure can. Okay, and so I um, and Eleni, sorry yeah. to interrupt. It looks like you have it on. Um, we're seeing your presenter screen. Um, 
so I'm sorry. Julia, say that to me again. We're seeing your presenter screen with the next slide and the notes. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, let's see. Um, is it better now? Nope, still the same. I think it was that display settings that you were clicking on up above. Let me share that. Let's see. There's a bunch of people in the room that are trying to help out. <laughs> we can't hear you if, if you're telling us. Someone needs to say there it. That mic. looks great. That looks great. Julia, Perfect. are you able to share? I'm I I don't wanna I don't wanna hold this up. I know there I, I'm gonna try and share sure. again. I just want to make sure that uh let's see. I got it. Oh, okay. I think thank you so much, Julia. <laughs> How's that look? That looks really good. On on my end, it looks really good. Looking good how, everywhere. How Thank does you. it look for everybody? It looks great. Let me see. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so give me one second, everybody. All right. Um so, uh, you know, I, we want to really thank you for inviting us today um, uh, so that we could share some of the Marin Keel collaborative work and want to extend a, a, a special thanks to Will and Chloe Cook, who isn't here with us, but is part of our uh, uh, team today, uh, and as well as the Bolina Civic Group. And so we're going to get started, but I'm going to invite my two other um uh, team members to introduce themselves. Julia kind of has started, so we'll start out with Julia and then uh, Sonia, and then I'll introduce myself and we'll start with the presentation. Thank you sure. so much. Thanks, Eleni, and my name is Julia Van Folen Kim. I'm with UC Cooperative Extension, which is the front door to the University of California, and we're located right in Marin County, um, and I'm a Spood Systems Advisor with UC Cooperative Extension, and I'll pass it on to Sonia. Hi everyone, my name is Sonia Hammonds and I joined you in person last month. Great to be here again. Um, I'm with the brand new um, Marin County Measure A grant program for food, agriculture and resilient ecosystems. It just launched officially yesterday. And um, so I'm here about the grant program in general. And um, so I'll pass it back to Eleni and Julia who are going to be talking about a specific potential collaborative proposal for all of you in West Marin. And um, also there are opportunities to apply on many other projects. So um, stay in touch and Will has all my contact info. Thank you so much, um, uh, Sonia and Julia. Uh, my name is Eleni Nagusi and I am with the County of Marin in the Nutrition Wellness Program. I'm a program manager for the Nutrition Wellness Program. And we're gonna, we know that um, time is tight, so we're gonna try and breeze through this uh, presentation. But just to give you an overview for our presentation, we're gonna share some background information on food security, a uh, little bit of information about our Marin Hill Collaborative, uh, share with you our current goals uh, and the communities where we work. Um, and then uh, we're gonna share um, uh, some of the partnerships that uh, we uh, have put together with this collaborative uh, and this team that you're going to hear from today, as well as what our plans are and our strategies are to access funds to support the work that we do. So next slide, please, um, Julia. Um, so, you know, most of you have probably seen this uh, slide. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time on it. You all know that uh, Marin County is... Um, one of the counties that keeps getting ranked the healthiest county in California. But of course, on the flip side of that, we also know that um, that is not a reality for everybody in Marin um, County. While we have this abundance of food that, uh, that is of excellent quality, we also know that um, there is uh, about 16% of our residents that are food insecure. And in addition to that, we also know that although we're the healthiest, we're also ranked as uh, 
very high in income inequality. And the consequences for income inequality are not just food insecurity. You know, um, we know that folks in Marin, uh, in West Marin especially, have also to deal with inadequate housing, lack of transportation, lack of quality education, and that we, most of the folks in West Marin that are affected are older adults and the immigrant um, community. So, you know, with that background, you know, now we're going to share a little bit about uh, what we're doing in Heal with you. Um, Marin Heal is part of the county's nutrition wellness program, and it is our community facing collaborative. And what it mainly focuses on is supporting healthy eating and active living opportunities, mostly within uh, low income and marginalized communities. Um, and right now, our goal is implementing um, equitable food systems, uh, and we want to uphold uh, control of, of decision making within uh, the communities that are affected. And we want to also ensure that communities of color and those that are specifically affected uh, with food insecurity are the ones that are leading the work. Um, and so let's go to the next slide, Julia. And so just to give you a quick background, um, um, the reason why we're here implementing equitable food systems is that our HEAL collaborative, which, which includes a steering committee and subcommittees that guide its work, um, usually assesses past, you know its past work it will kind of do a pause after like two three years of, of implementing a goal that that has been decided on we kind of take a pause to really figure out are we really doing the work that we need to do um, is the data current is is our progress reaching our goal and so um about two years ago we had one of those strategic planning moments and so we had over um 167 collaborative members, some of which are right here in this room. We had nine steering committee members and we had 24 key uh, informant interviews participating to then decide on what the current goal is, which is implementing equitable food systems. And we wanted to focus on the three most affected communities. And those three communities were the Canal Neighborhood, Marin City and West Marin. So, um, just going forward, uh, after after we uh, finished our uh, strategic planning uh, uh, process and we landed on equitable food systems, uh, Marin County uh, uh, pro provided us with some funding and we put out an RFP. Um, some of you in this room also were part of that process. And we uh, then were uh, able to begin working on Three of the focus communities um, and going into those three uh, focus communities to select place-based community organizations to lead the work that, uh, you know, to lead this equitable food system work. And the three community uh, action teams that were selected in the three communities were West Marin Community Services in West Marin, the Marin County Cooperation Team in Marin City and Alcohol Justice in the Canal. Um, so over the past year, or, or now it's a, almost two years, each of these community action teams have been working within their own communities and they've been building capacity and engaging the community because we wanted to circle back to the community and ensure that the selected priorities through our key informant interviews were really what the community still wanted us to um, work on. Um, so that has been what's been happening in the past um, uh, year and a half. And I'm gonna ask Julia to go to the next slide because we wanna share with you uh, the, the priorities that were uh, chosen in each of these three communities after they've done um, these two years of, of, of work. And so, um, as you could see in West Marin, and Julia, we could go to the next slide. Uh, what, West, one more? Yes, one more. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in, in West Marin, uh, uh, what was the, the two organizations that uh, collaborated to do this work were actually uh, West Marin Community Services and San Geronimo Valley Community Center. Uh, they went out, they surveyed the community, uh, they brought community organizations together for discussions, 
And at the end of all of that, what they came up with was that in West, Mar in West Marin, how they want this work to unfold is they want to see a coordination of communal gardens, um, uh, garden access for everybody so that people can glean, uh, can plant food. They wanted to establish land trusts uh, for agricultural workers and community members to own land and procure food. And the last um, item uh, or priority was to install water catchment systems um, so that you know we can support folks in West Marin to grow their own food and have access to healthy food and um, water systems. Um, so we're gonna skip through uh, the next two. The same process happened in Marin City uh, and in um, the Canal neighborhood. And uh, our website is marinheal.org. So if you wanted to really learn a little bit more extensively and learn about the other priorities in the other communities, please feel free to um, go on the website and you will find all of that background information. But in the interest of time, I'm gonna turn it over to Julia for the next part of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Eleni, and sorry for my sticky mouse not being able to advance the slides so smoothly. Um, so as Eleni expressed, there's a real opportunity for Marin City, the Canal in San Rafael, and West Marin to take a collective approach to seeking opportunities to increase food production um, that's really community-owned and community-driven. And um, leveraging that priority, we're seeking um, collective funding um, to realize that dream. And so we see the Measure A FAIR grant that Sonia spoke about last um, session as a really unique um, and mission aligned funding opportunity to deepen this work around um, community food production and community gardening. So the proposal that we bring to all of you today is to expand um, food production capacity of community and school gardens in underserved communities, including across West Marin, as well as in the Canal and in Marin City. And the proposal that we're, we're pitching is um, to seek funding for supporting paid garden staff to increase food production capacity um, across community and school gardens in each of the areas um, by having more um, coordinated garden planning and design, water and soil management and crop planning, and actually to provide the hands and the labor to do some of this work that is so often um, relying solely on volunteers. We also seek to um, really create a network of peer mentorship with hands-on opportunities to exchange information across gardeners and farmers who are really the local experts. We seek to distribute um, free compost, mulch, seeds, and starts um, as a way to make sure that um, under-resourced gardens have access to the garden inputs that they need to uh, create to be the most productive and thereby build capacity for community and school gardens across the county. And lastly, we're proposing that um, we would collect data across these gardens to be able to evaluate and measure the impact. So that's the proposal as it's emerging now, and it's very much in the concept stage, and we're open for suggestions and iterative feedback about what's really needed um, locally. So I'll hand it over to Sonia now to um, tell a little about the Measure A grant program and re remind you all of what it entails. Thanks, Julia. Um... I'm having my own technical glitches, so I'm on my phone. Hi, everyone. Um, so Eleni and Julia were sharing about a um, specific proposal that the HEAL program, the Healthy Eating Active Living Collaborative, is thinking of proposing to this grant. Um, and it will be great to have Belina's input on that proposal. And I just wanted to clarify more broadly about this new grant program that welcomes applications from many community organizations on a range of topics. So this could fund just about anything related to sustainable agriculture and food systems, everything from conservation work on farms to um, supporting uh, community kitchens and um, food-based micro businesses and a whole lot more. So there's opportunities to be creative. 
Um, the application a period just opened yesterday. Big news. So this officially launched just yesterday. Um, and I welcome you to get in touch if you'd like to learn more. We'll have a bunch of workshops coming up to um, learn more about the grant program. So if you or your contacts or other community organizations are interested, um, get in touch. And grants can be between $15,000 and $200,000. Um, and we'll be doing this every year for the next eight years. And then it will go back to the Marin County voters because this is funded by a ballot measure that you all voted on, um, Measure A. Um, thank you. So with that, um, just to close, um, a reminder that we're seeking input um, and seeking specifically a West Marin community partner to lead the efforts um, across community and school gardens. Um, so we're ex having exploratory conversations to try and find the right fit um, of a nonprofit with the capacity to serve all of West Marin, which we know is really geographically um, spread out and therefore hard to um, find someone with that capacity. Um, where next steps are to start implementing the West Marin community selected priorities and to really move from a planning stage to starting to implement and act on those. And then we're really hoping to foster connection um, from across HEAL community action teams, across the opportunities for Measure A funding, and the many great ideas that all of you have um, to improve our community's health and access to food. So with that, thank you very much, and thanks for having us. Thank you. Oh. Everyone's clapping. I don't know if you can hear it, but everyone's clapping. <laughs> Thank you so and much. And I'm going to remember uh, to do the thing real quick. I have to share. Oh, goodness. Where is the Zoom screen? Oh, there it is. Great. Fantastic. Uh, we're going to one. First thing. Sorry, everyone. This is these technical back and forths are a little bit. We're going to spotlight me. And then we're going to go here to share screen. And we're going to share the Prezo again. Da, 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 da. We're going to bring this back up on the screen for everybody in the room. And then I'm going to walk over here. And I'm going to say hi, everybody. Welcome back, back into re real world, virtual world, whatever it is. Um, I also want to say, as a part of the uh, the Heal program, we have linked the survey on the Bolina Civic Group website. It's the second item down below this meeting uh, with a link uh, to a, a survey that they're running, uh, which would greatly use our input as a community. Um, so if you have thoughts, feelings, there's some great questions there. They're hyper local to West Marin. Make sure you fill out that survey for these folks uh, because they do want your input as someone who's been spending a fair amount of time talking to them. Next up, we're going to bring in uh, Annie and the BCLT and Sarah Jones. And I'm going to sing a little song while we wait for people to come up to the room. Hi, Sarah. Sarah's got her own little song. I'm, I'm doing, I'm channeling Stu right now. Channeling Stu, everybody. Hi, everyone. Is this, is it on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't feel. You want to be more on? I don't, I don't want it more on, but I, oh. I want you to pick up my, okay, oh, yeah, we're great. Good. We're good. Okay. Hi, everyone. I, thank you for having me. And I understand I was late and I missed our time slot. So I apologize for that. I was uh, driving over here from Civic Center. My name is Sarah Jones. I'm the director of the Community Development Agency for the county. Uh, and I'm here because uh, Annie reached out to me yesterday and let me know that she was going to be talking to the group uh, with and some questions had emerged around the uh, the BCLT campground project uh, on the property next to uh, the Tachera Ranch property. And so when she was going over the questions and trying to get answers, and it was a lot of stuff about coastal permits and emergency coastal permits and use permits and code enforcement, I said, let me come out and, uh, and help you out. So that is why I'm here. And I, as I said, I'm the director of the Community Development Agency. Uh, for those who don't know, the Community Development Agency has a whole bunch of functions, many of which are uh, involved in a lot of ways in this project. We have 
planning, which issues land use entitlements. We have building and safety, which uh, issues building permits. We have environmental health services, which does a whole lot of things, uh, one of them being septic and well uh, work. We have uh, sustainability, which is, I think, one of the only parts of our department that's not involved in this. And we have housing and federal grants, uh, which handles housing policy and housing development. So our department uh, has been very involved in the work here uh, to address the housing conditions that residents on the ranch are facing. Um, I'm going to kind of go through a little bit of, you know, a, a piece of this timeline uh, about this project. And I'm going to start with last spring or summer, not last spring or summer, spring or summer of, of 2022, uh, when the uh, receiver for the chair ranch, Larry Baskin, reached out to the county and uh, let us know that he was preparing to um, go forward with sale of the property and wanted the county to come and do inspections uh, to assess um, the asset there, essentially. Uh, at, at that point in time, you know, we were aware that, uh, that Larry and BCLT were in discussions about um, BCLT purchasing the property and uh, ultimately working to pursue permanent housing uh, on that site for the tenants there. But while that permanent housing was being planned and funded and built, um, they would be, I, you know, kind of put, uh, put, put forward a creative solution of developing essentially a campground on the 20 acres that the land trust already owned next door. Um, and that it would also involve development of a septic system that could then serve the permanent housing. So that was kind of what we understood to be the, uh, the plan for what happens after the property gets sold. Uh, so we came out, uh, did the inspections, did not go into any of the living spaces, um, but our inspection did uh, cover the exterior and we found, you know, a number of situations that uh, were code violations, even without going inside, uh, mainly having to do with the water supply and how water was being provided to people and the uh, septic systems and therefore the, the toilets, the wastewater, uh, all of those things. So we identified uh, the lack of potable water and the lack of a wastewater system as you know, severe health and safety concerns uh, that would require abatement. Now, I, you know, one of the sort of the quote simplest way to address that is uh, to shut down the property and for everybody to have to move. Um, we were very aware and concerned and sensitive to the displacement impact of that. And so really wanted to work through a path that would allow the most severe of the, uh, of the health conditions and safety conditions to be addressed uh, for a short term while a solution could be put in place that would avoid displacement of people uh, living on the ranch. And so we uh, worked with Mr. Baskin, worked with the land trust, uh, worked with our own health and human services department and identified essentially uh, the sort of stopgap measures that are in place uh, on the ranch at this time. People have porta potties. Uh, we did have to require that the toilets be capped People have porta potties, and there is a very makeshift system for gray water, which is, you know, essentially wastewater that's not the worst of the wastewater. Uh, a very makeshift system for the gray water that, um, you know, and we felt that all of those things together avoided the health and environmental uh, damages that were occurring. And so we said, okay, you can have that in place, you know, essentially for a period of a number of months. 
uh, but that is not a system that can can be viable in wet weather. So, uh, you know, essentially, people need to be off this property by the time winter of 2023 rolls around. And uh, that's kind of where we are right now. So to get to that place of people being able to be off the property without being displaced, uh, the first step was we had to be able to get things set up that we could issue all of the necessary permits quickly. Uh, what that takes is what's called an emergency coastal permit. As you well know, Bolinas is in the coastal zone. Coastal permits are required uh, under the Coastal Commission. So. Um, uh, the land trust applied for an emergency coastal permit uh, that essentially kind of advanced that first set of entitlements of saying that this use is okay, kind of did a, a quick path to that so that all of the subsequent building permits, grading permits, septic permit, all of that could be sought and the construction could go ahead in a legal way. Uh, and so that is what we issued was that emergency coastal permit. What an emergency coastal permit requires is that you get the full on coastal development permit and all of the other land use entitlements by six months after the issuance of that emergency permit. And so uh, that's uh, what we're teeing up for right now. Um, there's going to be a hearing on, a, on October 19th for the uh, for the coastal development permit and for a conditional use permit uh, for the campground on that uh, 130 Mesa site. I hope I got the, I keep sorting out 130 and 160 Mesa, but the BCLT property is 130. Uh, and so that's, that's where we are on this project and with the permits. I mean, we are essentially applying all of our required codified permitting, um, all of our code enforcement policies uh, that we typically pursue and are, um, you know, seeking that here. It has been a, an enormous amount of work on the county side to uh, get this to be able to happen uh, on the timeline that we're looking for, but it has, that has only been like a tiny portion of the amount of work that the land trust and that many people in this community have put into it. So among other things, I really want to recognize um, the work of Bolinas in looking out for its people. Thank you, Sarah. Annie's on her way up. Those of you on the Zoom. Thank you, Sarah. So I think you can all appreciate why I was so relieved when Sarah said she would come and speak because she makes complicated things so much more understandable for all of us. So thank you. There are many things that I could share about the project right now. Um, I did publish a, a longer piece in the hearsay uh, from the land trust last Friday. So I would encourage folks to look at that if you haven't. I promised I'd stay to five minutes or under. Yeah. Yes. And I think what, what feels most important to share tonight is that the BCLT remains committed to working in partnership with members of the Teixeira family who currently reside on the ranch, the residents of the ranch, and the County of Marin. Our goal here is to develop safe and legal interim housing on the land that we own at 130 Mesa in the form of a temporary RV campground with the associated utilities. I want to take this moment to say and remind us all the Teixeira family, those family members are our neighbors. They're our friends, and they are a valued part of our community. The residents of the ranch are also our neighbors and our friends and a vital part of our community. I believe that you share this feeling with me that the children who live at the ranch bring us all pride 
and joy and enrich our local school. The residents add to our cultural fabric. They provide vital functions in our community, maintaining homes, helping our elders to age in place. And along with the multi-generational members of the Teixeira family, the residents and their families simply make our community complete. So we're at a moment where, as in all democratic societies, some members of our community, most recently as represented by Cheryl Ruggiero in a formal comment submitted to the County of Marin have begun to exercise their right to express a coordinated opposition to the emergency RV park that's currently under construction at 130 Mesa Road. And it is my personal opinion that this opposition is both unfortunate and misguided because opposition to the emergency RV campground stands for displacing essential and vulnerable members of our community. No other place has emerged in our community for the people who will be displaced in mass at the end of this month. Without the emergency RV campground, where else will they go to be housed in safe, dignified, clean, affordable, and healthy dwellings? Without this project, the residents of the Teixeira Ranch will be forced from Bolinas, and our community will also suffer for it. I know this is a strong message, but on behalf of the BCLT, I really am here today to urge our full community to come together. There are many ways to do that, but one of them is to support our neighbors and our friends who still live together, despite what they might be going through. They still live together right now on the Teixeira Ranch. And I wanna ask for your support to encourage that this project continue so that we can encourage the continuation of our complete whole community. And I'm asking you for you to express your support of the RV campground project by emailing a statement by the end of day Monday to info at bolinaslandtrust.org and we will make sure that your voices are heard at the DZA hearing on October 19th and the Board of Supervisors meeting on October 24th. I believe that together we can do this. Together we are doing this. So juntos, si se puede. Gracias. Thank you, Annie. Ooh. Sorry for so loud. Uh, moving right along. Uh, we're going to skip through the there. Where are we? Switch to Zoom. Don't need to do that. Oh, that's me again. That's me again. The West Marin Community Services has got a great presentation. Ed, are you coming up too? You're coming up too. Fantastic. Let's uh, let's just kick it off, and uh, we're gonna get into that. You can wherever you ever want. Oh, it's crowded over there. There's a lot of stuff in the corner. I'm gonna get out of the way now. Okay. <laughs> um, Good evening. <laughs> I need you to turn the camera off. Okay. Okay, good. Oh, what did I do? Up here, hold on one second. 
and we need to go over here and just say this again. All good. Just give us one second, everybody. Sorry. Do -do -do. Oh, yeah, thanks, thank everybody. You. Thanks. Do -do -do. And then we need to go back to the top. Do you want Ed? Do you want Ed, do you me to click through your slides for you guys? Would that be easier? She's going to click. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. First of all, I I have the pleasure of introducing Socorro Romo, who is the executive director of West Marin Community Services, a service organization that many of you know and use. Um, my name is Ed Kira. I've been a resident of Bolinas for some thirty some years, and um, I'm also a member of the governing board for West Marin Community Services, as well as Evie Wilhelm, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight. Um, me es grato tener la oportunidad de presentarles a Socorro Romo, directora ejecutiva de West Marin Community Services. Para ustedes que me conocen, me llamo Eduardo, residente de Bolinas hace, desde hace 30 años, y soy uh, miembro de la directiva, la junta directiva de esa organización, igual um, Evie Romo, uh, Evie Wilhelm. Bueno, adelante, socorro. Uh, gracias. Ed, and I need to move the microphone because I'm very short. <laughs> uh, thank you for introducing me, uh, Ed, and for making this possible. I have been wanting to come to your community for during the pandemic and after the pandemic, but unfortunately, we have been extremely busy. We haven't been able to get back on our feet, uh, but I'm glad to be here tonight. Uh, the goal of being here is to share with you about what we do at West Marine Community Services. I want you all to be aware of the programs and the services that we provide uh, because you're part of the community that we serve. And I hope that after sharing the information, you go to your neighbors and friends who are in need and direct them to our organization. Uh, I'll be start by reading the mission statement. And the mission statement of West Marine Community Services, the purpose of West Marine Community Services is to support programs and services that ensure the well-being of individuals and families in West Marine. Self-sufficiency, human dignity, and social justice are the values that guide our efforts. And by listening to Annie speaking, I really, it, she really touched my heart, and I really hope that this community really support this effort because that's justice right there. We have a plenty of work to do in our communities to make sure that justice is applied through our actions. Uh, we serve uh, all West Marine, as you can see, it's the, all the green area. Anyone living, uh, Anyone living in this area is welcome to apply for our services. Uh, the programs that we offer are, we have our food pantry, we uh, support families with financial assistance, we have youth services, Latino engagement, community response team, uh, the thrift store, and we, uh, we often embrace new projects to meet the current community needs. Uh, who we serve? We serve low-income families, seniors, downhouse, youth and children, the disabled, and West Mar the West Marine community, migrant community. Approximately 40% of our clients are um, the you know 40 five, 45 percent are below poverty level level 52 low income and three percent on moderate or middle income 
Uh, our food pantry is open five days a week. Uh, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, nine, nine to one. Tuesdays and Thursdays, 12 to, 12 to 4 p.m. Our main sponsors of this program are Marine Community Foundation, San Francisco Marine Food Bank, Extra Food, Bon Reyes Farmers Market, and many local business and, the, and individual donors. Uh, our, through our financial assistance, we provide rent assistance, emergency bills, car repairs, dental and small medical bills, emergent, emergency needs. We cover emergency needs such as housing items or small house repairs. And of course, any unexpected expenses during a crisis. Uh, our, through our affordable youth services, we offer an after-school program that is run every day, Monday to Friday, uh, for seven to eight graders. And we open five, uh, as I say, five days a week, three to six p.m. And the programs included art classes, cooking classes, mountain bike, fishing trips, sports, DJ, and more. And we also have summer programs. We have a basketball camp, field trips, and swim lessons, uh, our very traditional water dogs program. Uh, through the Abriendo Caminos, we empower and training. Uh, we support advocacy on housing, labor rights, education. We support community culture events and provide platforms for community conversation addressing equity. Our beloved Trey store has been there for many, many years now, and uh, uh, it's open Monday uh, to Friday. Uh, Monday, oh, oh my God, this is uh, wrong. Wednesday to Monday, uh, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. 100% of the profits go back to the community through child care grants, individual financial assistance, food pantry and resources, uh, and free vouchers for families and individuals in need. We, uh, during COVID, uh, we uh, were on the need of having a response, rapid response team. Some, uh, a core group who will respond to the needs that were coming day by day through the pandemic. Uh, we initiated with the COVID emergency response, uh, vaccines, testing, uh, information, and now it's becoming more towards uh, a coordinated communication effort to reach out to the communities and the goal is to continue with this project and be prepared for any emergency. We want to continue with this team. So if we ever face emergency, that we have to reach out to any community member, we already have this platform. We also have other supports and we have our family emergency fund. Uh, this fund, 100% of what we raise for the specific family goes, it's just a pass-through fund. We don't uh, take any money of those donations, it's all for the family. We facilitate communication between landlord, tenants, employer and employees, a referral, our claims to other services, Transportation to emergencies. If someone is dealing with a crisis and emergency need transportation, we offer that. Translations, interpretations, and we also help families completing or filling out documentation. Uh, I'll be standing on the back if you have any other questions. Uh, and I hope that this information is helpful for you to understand what we pro what services we provide and we're here to support your community too it's not just from reyes we want we're open to anyone in west marine thank you it's fantastic thank you for that 
Uh, very exciting. So community speakers, we've got next up. What's next? Oh, I have to click through the slides again. Let's find out. I've been bitten by mosquitoes like three times right now. Um, they're flying around, and it's really a lot of mosquito bites. Hope you guys on the Zoom uh, got your windows closed. Um, community projects are projects that are supported and facilitated by the Bolina Civic Group. Uh, we're going to quickly talk about, well, maybe not quickly, we're doing good on time. Can you believe that? I love it when it works out like a plan that works out. Um, we're going to talk about the post office. So the, yay, post office. Oh, the post office. Um, I'm going to start off real quick and just, uh, I want to introduce you guys to this beautiful piece of artwork uh, that uh, Perry uh, out of Oregon has made. Perry is a surfer who shows up in Bolinas occasionally, and he sent me a message the other day, and he said, I would love for this to be in Bolinas. So this is my call to the community. Uh, we're looking for a spot to hang this beautiful neon sign. So if anyone can think of a good spot, landlord, tenant, some, some place this can go, I've already asked the library, they can't do it. Um, but this is a beautiful neon sign. I'd love to see it in town. I'd like to introduce Ainor, who can come up. Thank you, Ainor, for being here. Ainor is going to talk about the post office Mesa Park plan. I can give you the dimensions of the sign in a little bit. Yeah, I do have them. Thank you. That's great. Well, thank you. I'm so inspired by the good works and service uh, that people do in West Marin and particularly in our town. So uh, it's, it's just inspirational to hear these things all in one evening. So interim post office plan, we revised it to the specs that the new specs that they requested, which was easy because it's modular. Um, and we've had that prepared since 48 hours after they told us that was the reason that they shut it down. Uh, we've not been able to re-engage the post office at this point, despite multiple requests on our side and Huffman's, et cetera. So we're going to go ahead and submit two versions of the plan. Um, it exceeds their square footage. Just to let you know, the square footage we designed it to was determined by a USPS real estate personnel a facilities personnel and their architect. So they created the first specs and the first design and they approved it. Then it got shut down. And after a few months, we were told the reason it got shut down is they wanted it to be bigger. So the spec that they gave us is way bigger than the post office we already had, but okay. So we've designed to that now and we're pushing that plan and a second plan so they can choose between or change it or tell us what they want next. So we're pushing those plans through towards DC and to district one. We've asked for engagement to help go back to the co-development model so we know we get it all right, but they haven't engaged in that way. So we're just gonna push the proposals over to them and said, here's what you asked for, this meets your specs and fingers crossed. And then we'll see what comes back. Um, but that's the door they opened for us. And so we're going to use that we were hoping to have re-engagement sooner, but as you know. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is we just got off the phone again with Huffman's office with Jenny Calloway, and there's so much more to this than our focus is the interim post office plan. We think that would solve a lot of our issues. So we're pressing on that really hard, but we all know there are other major crises that keep surfacing for people real true hardships and bizarre things. And John's gonna go into that in more detail, but Huffman's office wants to hear these. So we've asked you to send your complaints through the system. Everyone's doing that really well. Keep copies of those complaints. And then we're gonna ask you to email the copy of the complaint to Jenny Calloway at Huffman's office. She wants to gather the complaints. They wanna put them all in a collated message that they may need to use for leverage. But the complaints need to be specific to things like, I went to the post office and was shocked to find out that they had closed my post office box despite the fact that I had paid for it and now I don't know where my mail is. So make it as specific as you can rather than I'm just having a terrible time with this whole Kafkaesque mess. <laughs> and, and then what they'll do is they will email you back and say, do we have authorization to share your story? So you'll get a response back from that. Um, so we're pushing in a lot of directions. John's going to get much more detailed about it. And the committee continues to work uh, in a really brave and at times, <laughs> at times frustrating way, but we're, we're all so determined that this is the right thing for our communities to have a post office in Bolinas. 
seems silly to say it, master of the obvious, but um, we're still pressing hard on this. So the update is we're pushing two new proposals across that meet their requirements, and then we'll see what happens on that and update you right away on that. But please, there's another channel, do your complaints through the process. It's always fun to see the responses uh, on Nextdoor, but collect them and we'll we'll give you the channel. I have the email address. They just created a box just for us at Huffman's office, an email box. So I'll put that, we'll put that on the website, on in the hearsay and on Nextdoor. Thank you so much. It's a team effort. Thank you, Anna. John's on his way up. You can go, you can come on up. It's gonna come up. I think we should scratch the thing, scratch the two other slides because we got a new avenue that just opened oh, up. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's right? That's what I think is what well, she we, said. We'll just, we'll just put it we're we're working on the committee right now, everybody. <laughs> All right, cool. Hey everybody. Um, let me fix this thing here. Um I have limited time here to kind of cover a complicated subject. So um, I'm scripted. And I can't get too deep with examples, but I wanted to address some of why we got here, where we are, and I'm going to end up with next steps. Uh, we need help from from you and further actions that we're contemplating. This could go a bit long, but um, basically I want to present this for the record and so it'll be on YouTube and people could refer to it. Um, over eight months of personal experiences and observations, countless, countless reports from impacted citizens, review of hundreds of social media posts, engagement with qualified postal service experts, and lots of research, we have seen emerge a disturbing pattern of poor performance, mismanagement, and maybe worse, that needs to be acknowledged and addressed. I can only highlight a fraction of what we now know, but we can provide further public documentation moving forward. By addressing this delicate issue head on, I am vulnerable to criticism. And if recent tendencies continue, um, these observations may be portrayed as misinformation or unjust personal attack. Um, but, and you know, we may hear responses uh, and excuses that are framed in mail service improvements, operational needs, issues beyond our control, or otherwise obscured in an impenetrable bureaucratic void that is nearly impossible to pierce or confirm. We have accumulated facts and we will continue to collect data, piece together the timeline and prepare for potential further actions down the line should they be required. I only wish that our friends at the post office, office would be as public and clear as we are. Had, they been more uh, had there been more public engagement and transparency, as we had requested from the start, we most certainly would not be where we are today. We acknowledge that the circumstances of our temporary post office closure are not normal and represent a complicated and altogether unique set of issues to resolve. But after our town's unprecedented organization, engagement, and clarity on creating an achievable plan prioritizing rest restoration of a physical post office facility in Bolinas, we should absolutely by now be well on our way to a new interim post office. Instead, the sign leading into town now reminds us that it's been 222 days without a post office. And stunningly, we are moving backwards and further away from service to Olima. Worse yet, this week, there are reports that hundreds of box holders are now threatened to lose their Bolinas post office box with no chance for a new Bolinas box based on another in a disturbing pattern of hasty, arbitrary, and poorly communicated operational decisions, which appear to be orchestrated by our postmaster with support from others at the division office. Despite leading with our hearts, spending hundreds of volunteer hours creating a clear, reasonable uh, Bolina style postal service appeal campaign, including close to 1700 signatures on a viral petition, well over a thousand individually written appeal letters, countless public meetings and a passionate local rally, a forceful proclamation by the full Marin County Board of Supervisors backing from our elected congressional representative in DC, multiple editorials and press coverage supporting us across all media, and 
despite developing a flexible and informed turnkey plan, lining up support and consensus from all relevant agencies, elected officials, and even postal facility staff. Despite all this and more, we've been seemingly blocked at every turn. We've emphasized from the start that we want to work with all levels of the U.S. Postal Service to resolve this urgent crisis in a transparent and collaborative public planning process where Bellina citizens are given timely and clear information and an opportunity, opportunity to provide relevant input. This has not happened. Why? With respect and without getting personal, when one objectively explores the timeline and series of events uh, of this crisis, we see a pattern of mismanagement, incompetence, questionably justified decisions, and misplacement of priorities. There is no question that our postmaster and maybe even the district has countered our clear priority request to return our Bolinas Post Office with an absolute and unending emphasis on so-called home delivery and cluster boxes, which in truth have complicated our efforts rather than complemented them. Every single USPS postal re uh, public response, every time our service is further compromised, there has been very, a very strong talking point emphasis on, if you're unhappy with your service, reach out to your postmaster uh, for home delivery or cluster box units, rather than any mention of our interim facility plan. I don't doubt that our postmaster is hardworking and his position is challenging. And did you know that as of mid-August, he is postmaster of both Bolinas and Stinson Beach? Oh joy. I know a lot of people personally like Roosevelt. He's charming, personable, smart, experienced, and appears confident and credibly informed on postal issues and protocols. He even delivers mail directly to select businesses and individuals, which burnishes his image among some, but unfortunately has also led to some unnecessary division in our town. The friendly public face and hopeful rhetoric reflect a commitment to serving our town but the lack of robust public engagement and baffling handling of this crisis reflect otherwise. Some have suggested that it speaks to an emphasis on delivering fiscal and service cuts prioritized by the beleaguered postal service, such as cluster boxes, rather than returning an interim post office ASAP, which is our priority of, uh, which is the priority of this vulnerable little community uh, that the postal service serves. Our postmaster has wide discretion and operational authority and limited oversight in our unincorporated town. Since March, we have seen a pattern of arbitrary and rigid adherence to some USPS rules and regulations in ways that inconvenience us and coincidentally could gin up interest in cluster boxes while actually ignoring the fundamental mission of the post office, which is to allow every community to have a post office and reasonable and accessible levels of postal service. Yeah. Yeah. This crisis has been defined by a lack of clarity, chaos and confusion and delays. Here are some observations. Cluster boxes or so-called home delivery solutions may work for some and in parallel with our consensus priorities and may be part of a broader uh, restructure in our town but they have never been presented in a detailed, uh, detailed public fashion, only to individuals who may not be told or understand the full implications. Our critical priority is returning a post office, full stop. We are told by our postmaster that these cluster box plans will not impact the return of our post office, yet representatives in the real estate and facilities departments have told us flatly that, enough, it, that if enough cluster boxes are installed in town, it could absolutely jeopardize return of our post office. And the longer we're with, without a post office in town, the harder it will be to return. There is misinformation being spread to citizens and may, maybe even to high level postal decision makers that quote, the town does not want an interim post office or there are problems with our plans. Some individuals may feel this and some have been encouraged to express this. If you question anything this group is doing, reach out to us. 
objectively review our campaign, our plans, our flexibility, and our consensus. This type of cultivated disinformation is just not true for the vast majority of our town. Our interim facility plan was reviewed by our postmaster during a design committee meeting in early June, and he expressed general support and no critiques or concerns to the plan during a subsequent June 14 public meeting, although he mainly continued to emphasize his separate solution for cluster boxes or so-called home delivery. We subsequently had, meeting, uh, had weekly meetings with officials from USPS real estate facilities and the architect team. This USPS team actually scoped, sized, planned, and approved our Mesa Park interim plan. We were inches away from getting a lease draft when the Mesa Park interim facility effort was unexpectedly delayed due to previously undisclosed operational deficiencies regarding alleged issues which could have easily been addressed earlier to avoid further delay, but which, are, but which we're addressing now as Einor said. So in other words, they moved the goalpost after we did everything we were told. Here are select facts and performance issues that we have seen. Mishandled lease dispute. The Postal Service could have worked to stay in the original post office building on Brighton. This is the original sin that led to a cascade of problems. Yes, there was a lease dispute, including a letter threatening to terminate the lease. But that kind of action is not at all uncommon in such negotiations, and parties can often resolve it. From attorneys we have engaged with, while, while there were indeed leasehold issues to be resolved, and there may have been a written threat to terminate the lease, to our knowledge, there was never a formal eviction notice or process, and there was still a possibility the lease dispute could have been resolved or certainly delayed to avoid all of this. Instead, the post office moved out and has since blamed this whole fiasco on the lease dispute. And let's explore that a bit closer. On February 10th, our postmaster was advised by attorney in writing, in writing that the post office could not be locked out due to a threatening letter and urged the Postal Service to stay. The landlord would need to send an eviction notice and file an unlawful detainer suit, serve it, and then go to court and get a judgment of possession. This would take time, and because postal facilities have special lease protections, there was a strong case to stay and work it out. The suit could be defended for several reasons, including the need for our town to have a central postal service and recent improvements made to the facility to stay in the lease. On February 16th, our postmaster replied to that email. Thanks for the info. No news from the landlord attorney. Business as usual here at the Bolinas Post Office. The very next day, February 17th, the Postal Service sent out its press release stating that our post office was closing and moving to Alima. So, one day our postmaster tells the attorney, no word from the landlord, business as usual in Bopo. And the next day, the postal service announces the post that they're vacating the space. We have this all in writing. That's just not honest. And that's just one example that I'm outlining. We have a lot more. Further, in late May, the landlord's attorney told the Marin Independent Journal that the landlord had been open to negotiating a new lease agreement but the USPS, quote, never acknowledged or responded to our terms for a new lease, end quote. Instead of trying to work it out, they ceased communications, vacated, and intimated, intimated that they were evicted. This murky series of events has led to a lack of proper facilities, lack of adequate parcel storage, and a slew of other problems, problems that could have been avoided or delayed. Roosevelt may not have been directly responsible for lease negotiations, but he had been communicating directly with the landlord's attorney and should have informed his superiors or the leasing team of the lack of options in Bolinas before they moved out. Not telling superiors about challenges finding new locations in Bolinas or having an accessible Bolinas alternative lined up before they moved out. Roosevelt served in the his position for a few years. He knew Bolinas had very limited, really no viable options for a new post office location. 
This should have been part of the calculus of how to handle the lease dispute and how to avoid the crisis we have faced. But based on a conversation I had with a district official in April, it was not even a consideration. Mishandling transition from Bolinas to Alima, despite a protracted, protracted lease dispute and options to delay leaving the space, there was less than two weeks public notice of the closure. There was no clearly identified alternative location, no information on duration of closure, and no easy path to bring a post office back home. Lack of information led to chaos and confusion, moving us to Stinson Beach and recently back to Alima after our clear objections to, any, to that in, inconvenience, rather than focus on our intern, in, interim facility in town, are coldly justified but highly questionable, further burdening our citizens and not representing our interests or finding other less drastic solutions. High degree of returned mail and packages. The postmaster instituted a somewhat confusing new policy for how to address letters and mail uh, to Bolinas prior to the closure. There may, there may have been legitimate reasons for this, but the, the fact is residents and business cannot always control how the mail and parcels are addressed, even if we specifically request uh, that they be addressed exactly as detailed in this new requirement. Further, um, some vital suppliers like PG&E and some online order, order ordering forms do not allow the addresses to be filled out according to these rules. In the past, if goods were delivered to the post office but misaddressed, they could be rescued by staff and put in a system for pickup by customers. For example, previous Bolinas postmasters and Jim in Stinson Beach did this whenever possible. This subject deserves more attention but suffice it to say, many, many, many complaints and documentation have been made about this. Um, discretionary returning or destroying mail and packages that are not perfectly addressed may be by the book, but it's unnecessary, it degrades service, and is not fulfilling obligations to deliver mail, especially during a crisis period where customers need to drive far just to get their mail. I have personally had multiple uh, letters and parcels um, returned and destroyed. And I assume after this presentation, there may be more. <laughs> Discontinuing post office boxes. Uh, they're being cut off if you don't pay and you cannot get a new Bolinas post office. And the communication on this was very unclear. This is the worst in a time when we again need to go back to Alima after eight months with no service. Many citizens have questioned the requirement to pay for a P.O. box when they cannot even get real home delivery and have no actual P.O. box in the alternative locations in Olima or Stinson. This is just hardcore and cold. For the record, we recommend citizens pay for and document your payment of the post office box because we cannot control our postmaster's actions to deny your box, but we urge him and the post post office to lighten up immediately uh, under the circumstances. And if they're threatening to uh, take away boxes, let people have them. Um, it's unconscionable. Withholding or delaying information from the public and misleading the public. Right now, if you go to a Lehman and ask why the interim facility isn't happening, you're likely to see a photo that our postmaster gave staff of puddles at Mesa Park, implying that it floods which is a joke when you consider our site preparation plans and the history of flooding in Alima. This is pure gaslighting. Go to next door, you will see many instances of people being misled or inconsistent answers. Again, the way the closure was communicated, information was purposely delayed or withheld from the public. Other information like pickup times have been withheld or delayed or poorly communicated. In his very infrequent written or public statements and in his personal verbal interactions from behind the counter or while he's serving as a postal carrier. We have we have reports of answers that are inconsistent unclear incomplete and often phrased in misleading ways, we have documented examples of this and are collecting more. 
not supporting our clear community consensus plan for an interim facility. It is outrageous that the local postmaster would not work with us and for us to achieve our reasonable goals. Rather than supporting the plan, it appears that he may, may have actually undermined it or at least not supported it in a way that would help it proceed expeditiously. If he had any operational issues with our plan, he had ample opportunity weeks prior to advise us directly to resolve instead of any objections filtering out to superiors in a way that delayed it and has led to many more challenges that we now face. Forcing his own agenda, cluster boxes and home delivery, and questionable handling of Bolinas home delivery requests. Every single communication by the Postal Service and Postmaster has stressed, talk to the Postmaster about home delivery. How many of you have signed up for home delivery and not gotten it? Why are some individuals getting home delivery, but not everyone? Why has our postmaster created his own home delivery route while many inquiries for the Bolinas home delivery, while the many inquiries for Bolinas home delivery have apparently been held by the postmaster rather than shared or communicated via typical agency protocols to the third party carrier service that is legally contracted for home delivery in Bolinas? This is a really complicated issue, but there's some fishy stuff going on here and we're looking into it. So uh, there's some questionable activity and there, there's gonna be more on, on that issue. Here are highlights of just a few duties on key parts of the job where our postmaster is falling short based on USPS posted duties of a rural facility postmaster and events related to this crisis, including failing to show a satisfactory level of decision-making and problem-solving and not adequately resolving problems that occur during post office operations. Failing to properly and consistently service all customers and conduct operations with an attitude of responsive service to customers. Failing to ensure proper safeguards are instituted for the welfare of customers and the protection of males. Failure to provide clear, timely, or fully accurate answers to questions. Failure to escalate critical issues to superiors. Failure to sell ideas, positions, and recommend recommendations to others. Failure to communicate relevant information, both orally and in writing. Okay, what's our next steps? So we're focused on the revised interim plan that Einor just went over. Um, we're waiting for engagement and we're going to try to hit it on multiple levels and we're still hopeful despite this report. Um, if we don't get engagement, we're going to consider that other options that we can do and I'll outline some of them. It doesn't mean we are doing them. Um, one is we're looking to collect and consolidate more data regarding any service complaints, grievances, or personal accounts of mismanagement, um, incompetence, misinformation, incomplete information or questionable behavior by any of the operational people involved in the Bolinas post office. We appreciate any information you could provide and we're gonna provide a forum where you can report that. We have also created a survey to understand impacts and opinions regarding the way our post office box renewal program has been mishandled. There are forms that you can fill out, uh, there will be forms that you can fill out on the uh, Bolinas Civic Group website, and uh, we can talk about this after. Okay, cool. Um, we urge you to continue you to use uh, complaint forms on the USPS website, although uh, the complaints appear to be a dead end at the district level, with answers implying the issue is resolved, but it is still good to rack up complaints. If there are any residents who have bandwidth to help us on taking on this issue to the next level, if needed, please reach out to us. We can find a role for just about anybody. And we're not going there yet, uh, but we prefer to, to avoid any legal entanglements. But if we continue to be denied, we have additional options to explore and consider, including higher level complaints with the Office of Inspector General, which is a government oversight agency which requires, uh, this was gonna require much more detailed level of complaints, which we're working on now. And I'm kind of outlining a bit of it here. Seek support and action from various postal unions, 
there are several unions that have interests in this matter that could potentially get involved. And we've already reached out uh, uh, and started some discussions there. Engaging a third party high level investigative journalist to look into the story. We do have interest from one such reporter now, but before they can commit to exploring the story, we need to gather more information. Uh, if anyone has a connection with any other investigative journalists or any ideas in that area, please reach out. Potential legal action could be considered down the line if we continue to be denied service. But this is something uh, we would not pursue at this time because it could complicate any negotiations. But we could file an injunction and try to get a judge to force the Postal Service to meet its obligations to providing essential postal services in town. There are some other possible actions that we may take, we may take and I, we can review that later. So it's a pretty dark time and we're all exhausted, uh, but we're gonna keep up this fight. Uh, I'm quite grumpy about this now, and I'm sorry this presentation is kind of rushed and incomplete, but I hope this kind of helps bring you up to speed on kind of what's been going on. And I hope you all can continue to help. Um, it's astonishing that we need to keep doing this uh, but we can do this and we're going to do it till we, uh, till we get a post office back. Thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> thank you, John. Um, thank you, John. Uh, okay. Community projects. I think we're almost done. I'm going to do one real quick. Uh, this is me. My name is Will and I'm the, um, uh, Belina civic group guy who's doing this meeting tonight. Um, just to remind you guys, I'd love you all to show up for Belina civic soup, October 19th, free soup, free hanging out, free talking about everything you want to talk about with all the people that are working on it and more. Uh, there is more information on the Belina civic group.org website. Uh, apropos to the post office conversation, I will be updating the website in the next six, seven, 12 hours uh, after I get a little nap and uh, show up for that. Uh, I think it's wiggling. Yes, October 19th. That's next week. Woo, boy, time flies. I want to thank you all again for coming out, sticking with us as we provide valuable information to the community in lots of different ways and lots of different dimensions. And there's a hand raised. I'm Oh, Belina Civic Soup is a, a, an event that is being thrown by the Belina Civic Group to bring all of the speakers uh, who have been presenting over the last six months into a collective room where we're going to eat soup and talk about the things that matter to us. That would be at the Coast Cafe. Oh, five to seven. I should have put more stuff on the, on the <laughs> five, five to eight. Yes, five to eight. Soup will be served. Everyone's writing it down. Soup will be served. It's going to be great. It's uh, vegan uh, because everybody gets to enjoy everything. Everyone is invited and it's free. All right. All right, cool. Uh, the next meeting, and it's going to be special. I can't divulge why it's going to be special, but it's going to be special. It's going to be on November 8th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Bellinas Community Center and on Zoom, as always, the second Wednesday of every month. Thank you all so much. More information will be posted and published on the BellinasCivicGroup.org website. My name is Will Barlett. You are the community, and I'm so happy you're here tonight. Thank you all so much. And for those of you on Zoom, oh, they're clapping on Zoom too. Um, I'll answer your question in a second. I'm going to turn on some music and stop thinking.